check your air pressure in your tires. And there were those stations that would look under your hood. You would give him the money. For many of us, it was $2. And that would buy seven or more gallons of gasoline. And you would be on your way. Many folks never even knew where their gas tank was located on the vehicle they drove, and they had no reason to know it. It has now come to the place where one does not even need to see a human being to pay. Because some years ago, a gas station in Abilene, Texas, invented a system where a consumer could pay at the pump. Now, there are many other gadgets which have come on the scene most recently, such as iPods, which have sold more than 125 million devices, or DVDs, which replaced another rather new invention, videotapes. Many of us use computer tablets uh, either at work or in our hobbies. There is the lithium rechargeable batteries, which power so many of these new devices, including our laptop computers, which reminds me that the laptop itself is rather new, having been introduced in the 1980s, and some of them weighed in at a chunky 30 pounds or so. But maybe that invention which has most noticeably changed our, the way we live today is that which at first was only used by the wealthiest among us and then in the most luxury of luxurious automobiles. But this modern device took on new life when in 1983, Motorola introduced the Dynatac 8000X. Sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? It weighed in at two pounds. It cost $3,995. It was the beginning of the age of the cell phone. Now, I remember my first rather embarrassing introduction to this coming age. Uh, it was back in 1998, and I recall the date vividly as I go through the events that happened. You'll understand why. It was north of here, Saratoga Springs. I stopped to get some gas. Now, as the introduction said, I, I am a preacher, and we are expected to be automatically friendly, no matter the circumstances whether it be somebody coming in the middle of the night, leaving the lights off, and starting to take our blood. And I had that happen not too many days ago. And you want to look at them and say, please, turn on the light so you can make sure you're getting what you're getting. <laughs> we are expected to be friendly at all times and in every place. If we are not, then we are rather harshly judged as being arrogant, haughty, prideful, and sometimes much worse. Now, I'm always sensitive to this. I invariably try my best to greet people and particularly respond when they speak to me in a friendly and courteous way and respectful manner. Whether I remember who they are or not, and lately I've not been doing such a good job of remembering. So it was at this gas station, more than 125 miles from where I live, from my home, I got out of my car and started to pump gasoline at a rather busy place of business. And much to my surprise, and, and I was startled, astonishment, came this voice from the other side of the pump. 
which enthusiastically and neighborly said, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I was startled, but being the preacher that I am, I regained my composure quick enough to respond with the same kind of zeal. Fine, thank you. Well, almost without hesitation came this rather unusual inquiry from someone whose face I had not seen and just observed some legs there. The question was this, what time will you be home? <laughs> I thought for a moment. I did some rather quick calculations and responded probably about six o'clock. The voice from the other side of the gas pump said, can you make it any quicker? I was now quite puzzled. But I remembered, I'm the preacher. I need to be cheerful. I need to always be respectful, even to the most unusual of requests. So I said, well, maybe I can get there by 5.30 or so, but that's really pushing it. Well, with that response of mine came this statement that brought tears to my eyes and an immediate end to my pumping of gas as I made a quick exit from that gas station. As the legs on the other side of this pump said with some sarcasm, I need to go because there is this crazy old man from the other pump who keeps talking to me like he knows me. Now you and I think nothing of seeing someone walking down the street, maybe in the grocery store, perhaps in a mall, carrying on quite uh, an, an animated conversation, seemingly with themselves. <laughs> you ought to see some young lady who is talking to the fellow who is breaking up with her. What a conversation that is. No, you can't do that now. I'm right here in the mall. <laughs> Go home and do it, lady. <laughs> it is hard to fathom what will lie ahead and what will take place in the lives of these 2013 graduates. Now parents, I'll give you a, a, a scary thought. When their children, did you catch that? When their children come to, the, yeah, they, they, some of them are gonna have children. <laughs> Talk about changing your prayer life. <laughs> Remember, these are your grandchildren. When their children arrive at this particular point in their lives and attend their own commencement exercises. But with all of these changes, there is an enormous satisfying security in knowing that that which matters the most will not change or even worse be replaced somewhere down the road. I want to read to you a text from the Bible which has provided endless comfort to those enduring the most turbulent of times. We read in the book of Hebrews and chapter 6 that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, 
and which entereth into that within the veil, whether the, fore, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the middle of that passage, we have these preserved words of encouragement. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. No matter what may befall you, no matter what region calls to you and becomes your place of dwelling, what you must bear, you can and are allowed to and are given an eternal hope. No matter the circumstances or times, we read from the weeping prophet in Jeremiah, Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let it be said of these young people, as it was observed by David, For thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust, from my youth. The days of promise, of potential, of possibility lay ahead for each one of these 2013 graduates. For some of us here this evening, we have come to all well, too well even, understand what we read in Psalms 39. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. However, even for us whose physical strength may seem to be ebbing, ebbing we too <clears throat> are living in days of enormous hope. Let this message resound with that same assurance that the sun will rise in the east and will set in the west and let it forevermore be our unshakable and lasting hope. What again is pre preserved for us in the book of Titus, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our badge of courage, our song of endurance, our creed of steadfastness is this specific blessed hope, even anticipation for the coming of Christ, which no hurt can obliterate, no night can hide, no proclamation ever postpone. We are a people of faith. No matter at what stage of our lives, we have a glorious hope. The best for every one of us still lies just ahead. This hope provides for the believer an anchor for our souls, which is both, according to the text, both sure and steadfast. One of the most important tools of navigation are the buoys that are placed on the port and starboard side of each watery channel. These buoys are anchored and they are regularly checked for their accuracy because the survival of many depend on them being exactly where they need to be. They are anchored as best as man knows how. But upon these buoys beat the horrific storms of nature. And on occasion, they are dislodged and they drift to a slightly different location. Graduates, all of us, all of us desperately need an anchor which is both sure and steadfast. We need that which will not change because of the howling winds of popularity or because of the shifting tides 
of our own personal feelings. We will hear throughout our lives the nonsensical creed of follow your feelings and only do that which brings enjoyment. I suggest, respectfully and humbly suggest to you this evening, if that were the acceptable mantra of the ages, then I doubt you would be here this evening because no one would want to withstand Valley Forge or, or, or some of those incredible events that those who came before us were called upon to withstand. But that standard of always doing and only doing what you enjoy is really steeped in relativism will rob us along the way of the certain blessings of God. It will take away from us a lifetime of consistency and the landmarks of life that will bring us to our destination, our ultimate port of call of contentment and ultimate triumph. What then is that anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, I bring you back to the text this evening, for it says, even Jesus. He is our unchanging anchor. As a faithful reporter of that which is eternally true, as contrasted with that which changes with each passing decade or generation, listen to what the scriptures teach us Again in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Our Savior stated to the beloved Apostle John, and he made this profound statement more than 50 years after his literal bodily resurrection from the dead, recorded for us in the book of Revelation, he stated, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Young people, parents, guests, friends, much undoubtedly will yet change. And some of these changes will be dramatic. Just as we have seen many formidable transformations in the past half century. But there will be those matters which will not be altered. No matter the medical discoveries, the technological advances, the educational breakthroughs, or the financial mutations, even the best of us by our natures and by our personal choices. Our sinners estranged from God. I appreciated so very much the remarks of our valedictorian this evening. And I noted that those comments that appeal and to some and to others will be unfortunately, sadly rejected, those comments would not adorn the halls of our government schools. And while we hear the cry, we need more money to make things right, we stand in awe and wonder why our valedictorian cannot rise to her feet as she did here and say, listen, our problem isn't the lack of money. It doesn't begin with the lack of commitment of parents or teachers. It is a great spiritual issue that needs to be addressed. Our Bible still teaches us from the book of Romans for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the consequences of this situation are stark and crushing. 
Because the Bible goes on to say in the book of Isaiah, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. But there is the hope of eternal salvation and this invitation to everlasting redemption is open to all. And I for one am so glad that it was because I might have been outside that ship so designated if it were any other way. But our scriptures teach us that it is open to all. Again the book of Romans says, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. I respectfully now remind our congregation, all of us here this evening, that not all or involuntarily made the children of God. Because the same Bible which speaks of the glory of heaven and the splendors of eternal life also urgently warns us and again as the echo to the valedictory in a moment ago. My words added to what the scriptures say in the book of Revelation. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now I realize that subject is unpopular. Let me tell you something. I've been at it for a few years now. My son made me sound old. <laughs> Maybe I am. But you got the gray hair now. Listen to that. But I'm going to tell you something. It was unpopular when I first started out. There were churches and preachers who would never speak about the consequences of sin and wrong and unrighteousness. They only would speak to the love of God. But if you're going to address that magnificent love of God, the same place you learned of that love, you also learn of a coming judgment. There are churches and preachers who have stopped mentioning these genuine consequences. But if it was true 50 years ago, and it was, then it is true on this most significant and rewarding evening of commencement. I trust that you will make that decision that matters the most as far as your soul is concerned. This would be a wonderful moment to do so. Again, the preserved and uh, inspired words of God tell us in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians, but now is the accepted time. Behold, now, now is the day of salvation. And again, I... Pause to recognize what the valedictorian said we have tonight. We do not know what will happen tomorrow. You are only, and I as well, you are only one phone call away from having your lives tremendously and as far as this earth is concerned, changed. It was nine days after my son was born that my phone rang. It was 10.30 on a Sunday evening. And pastor, probably like you, began to think, who's gone to the hospital? Who's in need this evening? Where will I need to go? And you begin to do the checklist of who you know might be ill and who may need your attention. And as I grabbed the phone, it was a nurse from the emergency room at Prince George's County Hospital just outside of Washington, D.C., calling my name and saying, is this? And I said, yes. They said, you need to come quickly. Your father 
is critically ill. And a week later, he passed into glory. The most important issue to be considered this evening is your spiritual standing before the eternal magistrate. Because this Bible, which speaks so eloquently about the incomprehensible love of God, also compassionately warns us in Hebrews chapter 9, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. For those this evening hurting of soul and broken in spirit, would you please hear that gentle invitation given by our Savior from Matthew chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you this evening with most grateful hearts. We thank you for so great a salvation that provides eternal forgiveness, eternal redemption, eternal adoption through faith in your finished work on the cross of Calvary. No matter how bitter the winds of adversity may blow against us, we have that secure promise from John chapter 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I pray for these graduate candidates who sit before me. I ask that they might have the faith to trust in you wherever you lead them and whatever you call upon them to do. May a rich and rewarding revival begin in their endeavors and Lord sweep through this land because we so desperately need it. May there be a rebirth of concern and commitment to those issues which truly matter the most. I pray for all of those whose hope for tomorrow is dim, whose expectation of victory has nearly been extinguished, and whose vision of eternity is presently blurred. May these find in you all that their souls crave and their hearts seek. While we rejoice in the awards that these candidates will receive, let us not lose sight of the work to be done in our own lives as we submit to your leadership. Lord, I thank you this evening for the burden and desire of these parents who have sought not only academic excellence for their families, but for spiritual strength and growth. I well know that there have been some significant sacrifices made. And I pray that you might bless these parents extraordinarily. May their vision, their sacrifice, their burden be realized by others. And may we see other young people like these learn and be reminded of the truths will, which will never change and of a Savior who so promised never to leave thee nor forsake thee. I pray all of this in the name of our Savior. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
Now, as we go into this next part of our program, I would just like to remind you and ask again, we show respect to our graduates through applause only as we celebrate their achievement this evening. Pastor Walter, and of course our Latham Christian Academy School Board, these six students have met the graduation requirements of our academy and are presented to you to receive their high school diplomas. First, Mary May Burdick. Mary is the daughter of Jennifer Summers and Paul Burdick. She has attended LCA since fourth grade. Mary has played volleyball since seventh grade and known for her loving attitude has earned the special nickname of Mare Bear from her classmates and at least one teacher. Mary has served as a student prayer group leader, worked on the yearbook staff, and participated in fine arts. Mary plans to attend Fulton Montgomery Community College where she will begin work on her business degree this fall. Mary's life verse is 1 John 4.4, 4, year of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Mary May Burdick. Samantha Jane Cole. <laughs> Samantha is the daughter of Robert and Carolyn Cole and has attended LCA starting in K-4. Samantha has participated in nearly every area of our school during her high school years. She's played on the volleyball and basketball teams. She's a member of the American Christian Honor Society and has led a student prayer group. She has served as a student aide and has been on the yearbook staff and, of course, as you saw earlier, she's a member of our ensemble and has participated in NIAC's Fine Arts in many different categories. Samantha plans to attend Word of Life Bible Institute this fall to earn her one-year Bible certificate. After that, she says she may pursue culinary school. Samantha's life verse comes from Ecclesiastes 3.1, as you heard earlier, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Samantha Jane Cole. Samuel Richard Mansfield. <laughs> Sam is the son of Dave and Gail Mansfield. He has attended LC.